What an amazing morning we've had so far. I hope that you've come anticipating God speaking to your heart in many and different ways. Uh, one of the things we're continuing to do is to continue in this series that we're in on protecting the home. Last Sunday, we had the opportunity to talk about a foundation, and that is the righteousness that is in each of us with our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Only those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Only those who place their faith and trust <clears throat> in Jesus will be able to experience that righteousness. It is nothing that you and I can do on our own. We can't be good enough to be saved. We can't be good enough to experience righteousness and holiness. Just like that song saying that we sang, you overcome. God overcomes the things in our life and the sin through what Jesus did. So when we place our faith and trust in Him, we experience that together. So the righteousness that is in you, in you through Jesus is something that is the standard that we set upon and that we set for our lives and everything that we do. How do we protect the home? We protect the home by guarding the truth, and that truth is the righteousness in you and me. Today what we're going to be talking about is practical things to help guard that truth, to help guard that truth. You see, for each of our lives, there's a lot of things that we can do to try to become better. So a lot of stuff out there that we experience and try to do to make things better for our lives. But only when it comes to relating to other people will we understand that if we set a standard, the standard that God has for us, that we'll be able to have healthy relationships. And again, I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about all relationships. I'm even talking about relationships that you have with your siblings, brothers and sisters, with your parents, with kids, with grandparents with grandkids, with co-workers, every relation that we have with other people, these standards you can apply in your life. Now, I'm here to tell you that none of us are perfect. I am not perfect. There are times that I mess up. You can ask Missy. There are times I mess up. She'll tell you many times. There are times that our home is not the perfect home. We make mistakes. Missy and I make mistakes in parenting. Our kids make mistakes. The reason I know is because I made mistakes. Just ask my parents. They're here. They'll tell you stories. Some stories. Some we won't share. <laughs> thank, thank you, brother. <laughs> but let me ask you this question. What standard do you have for your life right now? In regards to how you relate to other people, how you relate to your friends or parents or whatever it might be, what is the standard that you have right now? Because let me tell you this. If you do not know the standard or have a standard for your life, somebody will set it for you. This world and culture that we live in will set the standard for you if you don't have one. And what you say, Paul, what do you mean by that standard? I'm saying how you live your life. What helps you make decisions in your relationships and in how you relate to other people. If you don't have that standard, somebody will set it for you. That's why it's important that if we're going to protect the home, the idea of the home that we have for ourselves and for other people. What we have to understand is that God has set a standard for us, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Because my question that I'm going to leave with you is, what is your standard? What standard do you have for your life? And what are you doing to guard that? Because you may think, okay, I have a standard. I know what I'm supposed to do. Well, what are you doing to guard that? Because if you don't guard it, somebody's going to come along and try to take that away or make you compromise, or bring some things in your life that's going to change your standard that you have. So let's look at that today. There's three areas of standards in relationships that we're going to look at. Some very practical stuff. Now, as in the first service, you probably looked at your bulletin and said, there's a lot of blanks here. We may be here for a while. No, we're not going to be here for a while. You just need to keep up. Okay? Because we're going to go through these. Because, again, it's not my standard, it's God's standard that we're setting out there that you and I know about, but are you going to guard that standard? That's the question I'm going to ask you at the very end. So if you doze off, it's okay, as long as you get the final question, okay? Stay with me. The first one is our mouth. Yes, our mouth. What comes out? Okay? The mouth, as we all know, is one of the most powerful things that we have in our whole being. Our mouth. What we say. The things that come out, the words that we use. Let me share some scripture with you, okay? Because there's a whole lot we could talk about this. We could be here all day talking about this. But again, 
I want to talk about the standard that we have in our relationships and how you relate to one another. And I'll explain what this has to do with protecting the home. The mouth. First verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. If you're not fast enough and turn there, you can read with me on the screen. They're all going to be listed on there. What this talks about is anger. Ooh, we're starting off good. Anger. In your anger, the passage says, the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, does he say, don't be angry? No, it doesn't say that. There is a time in our life where we have anger. I have anger at times. Sometimes I'm even angry with God because of the things that he allows to take place. And I've told you before, I don't understand everything there is to know about God. But I'm journeying in my faith to understand more and more every day because of the experiences I've had. But there's sometimes where I'm just like, God, I don't get it. And it makes me a little angry. I was speaking with someone just the other day. And they were saying, I'm not really mad at God. I'm just angry. Because of what's happened. And that's okay. What Paul says is, in your anger, do not sin. Be very careful how you let that out. I told the early service, sometimes we just get so angry that we have to vent. And that's okay. Go find a tree where nobody's around and vent all you want to. Because it won't hurt the tree's feelings. It won't affect the tree. So go say what you want to to the tree, just not anybody else. And sometimes we have to do that. Anger is something that can rob our words. When we get so angry at people that we say things that hurt, we have to be very careful. The Apostle Paul says, on the standard of your mouth, don't let anger come out. And why does he say don't go to bed with anger? Because anger is something that kind of, anger is unhealthy. When you fester in anger, Anger turns to bitterness, and bitterness causes a whole lot of problems, which is a whole other sermon. But anger can be very powerful and destroy us. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But what we have to understand is that he says, don't let the devil have a foothold. When we sit on anger, when we allow anger to fester within us, we're allowing Satan to say, okay, you can take over. Because basically what he says is, don't let Satan have a foothold. It's this idea that we... we, um, and I'll, I'll speak on this in a little bit, that we allow that to overtake us, to actually have control of the things that we do. So in regard to the standard of our mouth and our speech, don't let anger come, up, come out. Let's look at the next one, Ephesians chapter 4. Again, a like, little later in that chapter, verse 29 through 32. This is speaking about our words. This is a passage I love, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We have to be very careful with our words. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That means anything that's going to tear somebody down, just don't let it come out. In your relationships, don't let it come out. Because a lot of times we just get anger and we allow that anger to overcome us and we say things we shouldn't. Scripture teaches us, don't let anger, don't let anger turn into sin. Don't sin in that. Don't say things that are going to be hurtful. In relationships, this is one of the most powerful things we have. When I talk with people, whether it's individually in marriage counseling, one of the things you have, I always say is communication is the most important thing that you can have in your relationship. Communication. Learning how to talk with one another. A lot of times I tell people there's a certain language that we use when we communicate. I'm a big proponent of the five love languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. I love that book because it's very practical. And the principle is, find out how you can communicate because that's going to be healthy for your relationship. Some of us communicate differently. (laughs) And you're saying, yeah, I have a teenager and it's a different language. But even as adults, there's different languages that we communicate with one another. And we have to understand that in what we say. Don't let anything come out that's going to hurt somebody. And look at also what the Apostle Paul says here, because I think this is very important. In verse 30 of that passage, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. 
When we allow Satan to come in, whether it's anger or bad feelings, and we want to say things that will hurt other people, basically what Paul is saying is when you grieve the Holy Spirit, it's like you're not allowing him to do what he needs to. It's almost like we're saying, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, when we're saying grieve the Holy Spirit, you take a back seat while I take over. And then when we're done throwing out our venom or using the words that we don't really need to, and then we feel better or we think we feel better, then we're saying, okay, Spirit, you can come and take control again. That's what basically it means to grieve the Holy Spirit, not allowing them to do the work that they're placed within us to do. So we grieve the Holy Spirit. We say, Spirit, you take the back seat. Let me take control. We have to be very careful about the words that we say. The next scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, says this about thankfulness. It said, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Let the words be thanksgiving, being thankful for things, not focusing on the bad things. Now, I could talk a lot about the obscene language that we hear all the time and on TV and in movies and all that kind of stuff, the, fo- the foolish talk, the coarse joking, the cussing. I told this story earlier, and I'm real careful about using examples from my family because my kids really don't like it. But um, sometimes I do it anyway because it's a good illustration, and we all learn from it. And I learn from my mista- mistakes. But as kids, not as teenagers because it's different, as kids... We used to always um, say, you know, that the S word was a, a bad word. We don't say the S word in our house. And many of you are probably thinking, the S word. Okay, that S word. Well, no, it was a different S word. And I hesitate even saying it because I, I still hate it to this day. Shut up. I hate that word. Shut up. That was the S word. We didn't say that. That was a cuss word in our house. So when, they were, when the kids were growing up, they would say, oh, they said the S word. Or they said the S word. And so as they're older, they begin to think, oh, somebody said the S word. So when they heard somebody say the S word or referred to the S word, they thought it was shut up or stupid because those were S words. And we didn't say them in our house because I don't like those words. They're degrading. They're just wrong. They're not something that builds people up. And still to this day, I don't like it. When they say, I'm like, don't say that word. That's a cuss word in our house. Don't you remember that? (laughs) No, exactly. That's what they say. (laughs) But we have to be very careful. Another passage, let's continue on in James chapter 3. I love this passage because it talks about the tongue and how powerful the tongue is. The fact of taming the tongue. Listen to what it says in verse 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Strong words about the tongue. You know, a lot of times we say words that we wish we could take back. A great illustration is there's a small town pastor, <clears throat> pastor of a small church uh, in a town. And he had problems with, you know, people gossiping and talking bad about other people. And I know we don't deal with that at all here. So, but it was a bad thing about gossip. So what he did is he took this certain individual that was in his church out to the Main Street, the corner, because all they really had was a stop sign in this little small town. And he took a um, feather pillow and he ripped open that feather pillow. So the feathers just kind of went everywhere in the breeze. Wherever the breeze went, that's where the feathers went. Well, the next day he brings the person, this individual, back out to this particular spot, the same spot at the stop sign. And he said, okay, all the feathers that were released yesterday from that pillow, let's go pick them up. They said, well, that's impossible because they're everywhere. The feathers are everywhere. And he said, same is true for the words that we use. Once it's gone and out of our mouth, we can't take it back. Once it causes hurt, there's really no way to take that back because the experience has already happened. We have to be very careful with our words whether it's a friendship, whether it's a dating relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a a working relationship, whether it's with a brother or sister, a brother or sister, just making sure that soaks in a little bit, we have to be very careful with our words. And it doesn't matter what age we are because it all applies to every single one of us. Our words are very powerful. 
But God's standard, God's word says, don't let anything come out that's going to hurt someone unless it's going to build them up. Don't let anger come out as venom because it will attack somebody and hurt somebody. Don't let cussing come out. Don't let the foolishness come out. Don't let those um, jokes about people come out. Don't let that stuff come out because the standard is only what is, as he says, only what is benefiting others. Only what it shows compassion. Only what is kind. Only what is forgiving. This is what should come out of your mouth because this is the standard. The second area of standard that I want us to look at is our eyes. Not just our mouth, but our eyes. Let's look at this first verse in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. It speaks of coveting. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Do not covet. What it means by covet. In fact, when I looked this up, the first definition in the list of definitions was to desire wrongfully. To have a desire for something that's wrong. To look upon something and wish that you had it. That's covet. Now, you may have your wish list. I have a wish list of things that I'd like or things that I'd like to do. But Scripture tells us, and again, we're talking about a standard that God sets for us in our relation, relationships and relating to other people. That we should not covet. Something that they have that we want, we shouldn't covet. We shouldn't look upon that. Look upon that and see it with desire. Scripture says that's wrong. Do not covet. Now, what that can lead to is our next uh, verse in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. This speaks of adultery. Jesus is speaking and he says, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, adultery is basically having sex with someone that you are not married to. That's adultery. What Jesus says is, it's not even that you have to do that, but if you look at someone with lust, with desire, then that's the same thing as committing adultery. Folks, our eyes are almost as powerful as our tongue because what we allow ourselves to see, what we allow ourselves to look at, can rob us of the standard that God has for us. Again, the question is, what is your standard and how are you guarding that? If we are going to say that we are a follower of Jesus and we're going to protect the home in the way that he wants us to, we have to be very careful what we say. We have to be very careful what we see. There are so many people today that struggle with looking at things that they shouldn't. Whether that be things on internet or TV or movies or whatever it might be or other people. We have to be very careful what we see. The standard of God says don't covet and don't look lustfully because that's the same thing as adultery. It's the attitude of the heart, which we're going to speak on in a little bit. But again, let's look at the next passage of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, this speaks of lust. It says, flee the evil desires of youth. Or some translations say, flee from youthful lust. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What he's saying is, the standard that God has for us is flee from all those desires. If something's going to be lustful for you, and what I mean, if you're going to have a desire for someone or something or something you're watching or seeing or whatever it is, flee from that. In fact, the word flee actually means turn and run away from those things. The second passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, speaks of immorality. It says, again, listen to these words, flee, turn and run away from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore... Honor God with your body. We have to be very careful about the things that we see because they will lead us to do things that we desire. That's what the scripture is talking about. So again, I'm going to ask you this. What is your standard? 
What standard do you set to say, this is what I will not look at. This is what I will not watch. This is what I will not lustfully desire or, or look towards. What you have to do, because if you don't set it, someone will set it for you. Culture will set it for you. Somebody else will set it for you. A good friend will set it for you. If you do not set the standard to say, these are the things that I'm not going to look at because they're damaging to the relationships that I have. Because when you take it into your mind and it becomes a part of you, it's not just you. You share that with those around you. When you look at things or lust for things that you should not, when you allow those in, what it is, it becomes a part of you. So in your relationship, whether it's a girlfriend, boyfriend, that affects them. You share that with them. If it's your kids and you're, if you're married and have kids, then you share that with your kids. It's something that you have to guard against. And so many people struggle with this. Why? Because it's something that we can keep secret. But God's standard, His Word, says flee from that. Flee from the lust. Flee from the coveting. Flee from adultery. Flee from those things. Pursue righteousness. Your body is God's because the Holy Spirit now lives within you. So be very careful what you see. Be careful of what you see. Let's look at the third area. This one is the mind. And what I'm talking about here is our thoughts and our attitudes. The things that we have within us. Because thoughts create attitudes and attitudes create behavior. And behavior is a lifestyle. So we have to be very careful about our minds. Let's look at these scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 says this. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. What the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus. The early believers. Those who said they were followers of Jesus. He said this is how you need to live. Understand that you've been given a new attitude. Because of what Jesus did. Understand that this is how you are supposed to live. This is your attitude. And so it's very important that we have the right attitude. Knowing that Christ has now come and lives within us through the Holy Spirit. Now we should have the attitude. In fact, Paul even says in this passage, throw off all the old things because you've been given a new attitude. You think differently. You see differently. You speak differently because of the Spirit that is now in us. The attitude, the attitude of our heart is also very important. Let's look at the next passage. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 through 9. This talks about the spirit that is within us. The mind of the sinful man is death. The mind, what controls our attitudes and, and our actions. Our mind of the sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. If we profess to be followers of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, know that Christ now lives within you. His Spirit is within you. If you claim that, because there's a lot of people who claim to be Christians who aren't followers of Jesus. Let me tell you that. Our churches are full of them. People who say they're Christian and say they believe this, but they don't live it. That's a reality that we all have to deal with. So what I'm talking about is if you follow Jesus, then you now have the Spirit within you. You have a new attitude, a new mind, something that is controlled by the Spirit. When we allow Satan to come in and to tempt us and we go down that path and we fall away from God, then what we're doing is we're grieving the Holy Spirit. Because again, remember what grieving the Holy Spirit is. It is, Spirit, you take the back seat. I'm going to drive for a while. That's not what God asked us to do. He says, give everything to me so I can give everything to you. Bottom line. If we don't want God to have everything, then God won't have everything and we'll struggle. But what we have to understand is with our mouth, with our eyes, with our mind, they all set the standard of how we live and how we relate to one another. Again, I'll say this again. If you're in a dating relationship... Are you praying that God really wants you in that relationship? Are you praying for someone to come to be in a relationship? What kind of standards are you praying for? Are you saying, God, as long as they look good, it's okay? That's not a very good standard. It's a benefit, but it's not a good standard. Are we, are we saying, God, just help me to grow so that when I'm ready, there will be somebody out there who will compliment me? That's one of the best things I like about my, my wife's relationship, our relationship, is the fact that, yes, I'm talking about her. I always talk about her because I praise God that I'm 
I married way out of my league, and I'm very thankful for that. And it's one of these things where, yes, there are times we struggle and we have to communicate in the language that we've learned to communicate to one another. We have to work at it. But the thing that I like is that it completes me. I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for my wife. She takes all the bad with the good, the little good. But we're, we're in a working commitment to see that that happens. And I'm not saying, oh, we have everything great and wonderful. I'm telling you that when you allow yourself for God to work on all the things that you need to work on in your life, He can give you something great in a relationship. And that's what you need to be praying for. I still continue to pray for that because we're not there yet. We haven't reached that point yet where we're just totally satisfied because we've got to work. It's kind of like this. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go pick corn. I said pick corn, and somebody said, you don't pick corn, you pick beans. You gather corn. We went to a field, and we fill up a bag of corn. Call it whatever you want to. I had fun doing it. It was something that I'd never done before. And I thought to myself as I was preparing for this sermon, I said, you know, if I'm asking people to guard the standard, whatever standard you might have, hopefully God's standard in your life, if you have an opportunity to guard that, it takes work to guard that standard. Just like a farmer doesn't just go out and throw out seed. Some of you may even have a backyard garden and you just kind of go out there and throw out seed and things grow, right? No, wrong, exactly. You have to go out there and work. Just ask a farmer, ask somebody who has a garden. They work, they go out, they till the ground, they prepare the ground, they put the seed, they water, they fertilize, they get the weeds, they go pick or gather, whatever you want to do. They get the stuff. But they have to work at it. It's the same thing on our standard. If you do not, regardless of your age, I don't care if you're 7 years old or 70, regardless of your age, if you do not set the standard in your life of what you want in relationships, somebody's going to come along and say, that's not right. You need to tolerate. You need to lay off. You need to compromise. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to say this. Be cool with things. Somebody will come along and change your standard. So my question is, what standard do you have right now? Students, what standard do you have in your dating relationships? And you say, well, I don't have a dating relationship. What do you pray for in your dating relationships? What standard do you have? Because if you begin to compromise, then what you're going to do is you're going to miss the standard that God has for you. And when you don't have God's standard in your life, then what are you living by? What are you living by? What are we living by if we do not have God's standard? And here's the other question. You've got to guard that. And it takes work. You can't just expect a happy marriage to happen. One of the interesting things that I like is the initial meeting that I have with a couple that I'm doing pre-marriage counseling with. I kind of say, why do you want to get married? Oh, we're in love. I'm like, that's great. Why do you want to get married? <laughs> you have to work at these relationships. And it begins with establishing the standards that you're going to have. And you continue to guard. Because if not, something will come along and rob you of what kind of home you want to live in. What do we do to work at that? Let's look at the last passage, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 14. Colossians chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me because this is a lengthy passage, but I want us to read this together. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says this. <clears throat> Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Now, let me just stop right there. This is a very powerful statement for each and every one of us. It says, since you have been raised with Christ. Now, what does that really mean? Since you have accepted what Jesus did for you. Because remember, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and he rose again. So, if you agree with that and accept what Jesus did for you, basically, what happens is you were dead with him and the sin raised to walk in a new life that's what we say when we baptize people because it symbolizes the death to the old life and the new life that you have so what he's saying is that um, since then you have been raised with christ set your hearts on things above where christ is seated at the right hand of god listen to what he says verse 2 set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with christ and god when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, listen to this, verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in this way in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things, such as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the Creator. Verse 11, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, verse 12, listen to this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, what this is saying is, it's asking this question. What standard does God have for me in my, in my relations, in the things that I do with people, in the boyfriend or girlfriend that I have, in the marriage that I have? What standard is God asking me to have? What standard for your eyes? What standard for your mouth in the words that you say? What standard in the attitude and what you think about? What standard is God asking you to have today? Because I'll tell you this. In a crowd this big, somebody out there right now is struggling with the standard that you have in your life. You're saying, you know, it's not a godly thing. It's not righteous. It's not holy. It's not what God wants for me. The standard I'm living by is not what God would be pleased with. The standard I'm living by is not something that God can bless. And my question is, why are you living by that standard when you can live in freedom by the standard that God has for you? See, God calls all of us to be in a wonderful relationship with Him, to be able to relate to other people because of Him, to be able to grow in a happy home because of how He blesses. us. You set the standard by what you say, what you see, and what you think. Let me close with this passage I shared it last week and will continue to share it all through this series. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. What standard do you have? What are you living by today? It doesn't matter what age. Even as a small child, what kind of standard do you have? How do you react to other people? What do you say to other people? Are you angry with your brother or sister? Are you angry with your spouse? Are you angry with your kids? Are you angry with your parents? Don't answer that. Are you angry with people in general? How do we protect and guard the standard that we have. We first have to know what standard do you have. If you're not living by God's standard, it's only going to create pain. And it's only going to create problems and struggles. What standard do you have? If Christ is in us because of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then we can experience the standard that God has for us and create a home that we truly want to protect and guard. What are you guarding today? Let's pray.